we're going to get started in here um, with the cost of production presentation. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory as to why I'm up here and not somebody else. So if I if I stumble through a few of my slides, it's because this slide deck was put together on on Sunday afternoon uh, when um, Saturday we found out that uh, uh, the person that we uh, had planned to have here not only wasn't able to make it, they're willing to do talks in the winter uh, with us, but they, there was just no way uh, that it was going to work for them uh, to come down here. And we only, we found that out last minute. So um, that's why I'm doing this talk, uh, because to ask someone to, you know, come in on uh, such short notice and, and do it um, is a bit of a challenge when you're trying to put everything else together. So bear with me. Um, I'm basically going to review a few, uh, what I think is key aspects of cost of production, talk a little bit about uh, what I call the current situation with regards to cost of production. And uh, um, I'm not going to delve a lot into this circling circles of influence, but I will touch on it briefly in a couple of my, uh, in a couple of my slides. Um, how many of you have, gone and listened to someone give a cost of production presentation, whether it's sheep, beef, I don't care what it is, chickens, right? Manufacturing, right? I see hands. And it puts me in mind of the conversation we had during the market panel is um, we all want an answer for our situation, but we, we, we often get in the it's not dangerous, but the delicate situation of we talk about the industry as if it's one, right? Same holds true with cost of production. Which cost of production are we going to talk about? Um, because it diff we know it differs between production systems. We know our cost of production is going to be different based on, on where we are on the scale of size, right? Um, <clears throat> we know it's going to be different if I'm really tight with my with my spending uh, and really, really critical of anything I purchase or buy versus the person that says, oh my God, I like that new thing and I'm going to buy it because I can see, you know, it's going to be fun to use, right? Um, so cost control, we all have different levels of cost control within our, within our um, management systems. We also in the industry, the industry, we also have very different skill sets. We have producers that are new to the industry and on a very steep learning curve. We have producers that have gone through that and are, you know have an a excellent skill set in terms of management um, and are doing great. And then we have you know what I call us, us sunsetters that are in our probably I don't want to say our last years of being in the sheep industry, but in our in our sunset years of being in the sheep industry. Um, where maybe cost control isn't the biggest item on our on our list. Maybe it's that we want to have a, a flock just enough that we're uh, you know got our got our finger in the industry. And lastly, which is what today was about, was marketing. Uh, we all have different marketing plans. We all have different marketing costs um, because we live in the great province of Ontario, and you know in reality the the, the hub of our market is the Toronto. And, and burbs of Toronto, um, and we have land production throughout the entire province. So for me to stand up here and say, and this is what you do, or this is what you should do, um, or consider uh, to manage your cost of production, you have to take that with the grain of salt that anything I say may or may not apply to your specific situation, just dependent where you are on that, okay? So a few other challenges. Um, when we look for financial data on the industry uh, to use as a benchmark as to you know where I am, um, what what's what's a expected or a normal uh, level of of costs, the last extensive one, intensive one that was done was two thousand and nine, two thousand and eleven, so twelve years ago. Um, 
I think that when you look at it, it, there's still some very useful information in that. And, and I will refer, refer to a couple of the slides uh, from that study in uh, a little bit later on. Um, we also have OMAFRA's Farm Financial Analysis Summary. And the most recent one is uh, covers the years 2017 to 2021. Um, and that analysis is based on folks who participate in our business risk management programs. And so it's, you know, um, uh, th there's parameters on it. 80% of their income must come from sheep and lamb sales uh, and flock sizes of greater than 200 ewes. And so I'll be referring to some of those numbers onwards. Um, but we know what happened with our input costs uh, during the tail end of COVID through last year into this year. Um, so even the numbers from 2017 to 2021 um, don't truly reflect what is going on right now in our industry. Um, so again, I'll, I will touch on that a little bit again. Uh, this slide, and quite a few of my slides are credit of uh, to John Molenhouse, uh, the Omafra uh, Cost of Production Specialist uh, working out of the Brighton office. Uh, he gave a presentation in our um, Master Shepherds business planning module last December. And uh, so I'm using a number of his slides and you will note the credit to him on the ones that I'm using. Um, so this is back to the the uh benchmarking study that was done 2009 2011 um in terms of trying to identify key performance indicators uh of the farmers that were involved in that study what was it that they did that put them at the top end of the group versus the average versus the the bottom end um and so it's you know basically three components is looking at their management practices there was a very extensive um survey that everyone did um, it, it was tied to their actual financial numbers, not the ones they gave, but the one that the the uh, accountant that was hired to go and sit down with them and review their review their books for each of those three years as the project went on. Um, and then, you know, pulling that, trying to tie it to some of those financial performance numbers that you see uh, talked about in the cost of production um, presentations that you we all we all go to. Um, so from that study, these were the top four KPIs, regardless of um, uh, size of the flock or number of years that you were in the industry. It was, you know, when we when we talk about um, uh, key performance indicators and trying to manage our costs, it it does always come back to. I mean, in this instance, we're saying flock size, but in reality, how many animals were marketing? or have marketable in a, in a window of time uh, to cover uh, and pay for our input costs. Um, cost control was number two. Productivity within the flock uh, was number three. Uh, so that's, again, coming back to how many lambs were marketed out of the production unit, the, the U flock. Um, and fourthly, um, was making extensive and efficient uses of pasture. And so it was in, interesting to me, most of you that know me know that I'm a, a diehard on, on promoting pasture and pasture management. Um, and so it's interesting to me, uh, uh, the comments uh, that, uh, that we had, we had from our uh, market panel on, on pasture lambs. Um, and it's certainly something I think that as an industry, we need to explore more um, because I, my own belief is, is that a portion of it is that we don't have enough lambs, you know, both Bale and Wahab talked about, we want the middle of the pack. We don't want the, we don't want the bottom end. We don't want the top end because we're, we're marketing. We have the same customers every week and we, we need to be able to supply them what they need, but it doesn't mean that there's not markets for those, for those animals out there. I'm just getting sidetracked. So, but that's, that's, uh, as I say, certainly food for thought for future uh, discussions within the industry. Um, jumping back to cost of production, the other challenges, are we talking what, what you need to do in the next, I don't know, 12 months, 18 months to manage through tough times? Uh, are we talking about sort of midterm cost of production? Um, 
where we're, you know, doing a little bit of what we would call midterm planning, where we're going to be three years from now and trying to maneuver our way through that. Or are we looking at it longer term that I, you know, I'm, I'm planning to be in this industry for 20 or 30 years. Um, and is this something worth looking at and investing and switching from beef when I can get how much for my cow calf pairs right now? And, you know, maybe I could, maybe I could switch and, and hit the land market when prices are coming back up. That's just me speculating. Um, so which one of those do we want to talk about? Because the answers are going to be different, right? Or could be different. I shouldn't say are, or could be. Um, why do we look at cost of production in three segments or three units? Um, because really that short-term one is, you know, what do I need to do to pay my bills that are due today or yesterday or last week or next week? And midterm uh, financials is, you know, uh, continuing to the, the, the ability of the farm to continue operating um, if we need to replace something, equipment, you know, keep back replacements for the flock, um, what have you, improve your fencing, what have you. Longer term would be things like, you know, looking at uh, whether or not um, what we're doing, uh, we're capturing those opportunities of using resources differently uh, than what we are now. Like what's the best use of the resources we have, right? Um, and that's in terms of land labor and, and capital. And uh, I'm not gonna delve any deeper into that than what I've just done. I just want you to recognize that depending where you're at in your mind as to what, which one of these you want an answer to, you may be disappointed in what I say for the rest of the presentation, because I may not be answering your question. Before I delve into it, again, I want to review uh, that that when we now look at the you know, OMAFRA numbers, they have gone, and they're not the only ones, but the, the, we're going to a more consistent, standardized financial reporting so that you know we can hopefully compare apples to apples. Am I too loud? It's right in my... Was it getting an echo? Is that better? Okay. Um, so we basically look at farm revenue and some of the numbers I'm going to show, we'll use this exact, uh, template cost of goods sold, which is basically the equivalent of our, uh, what you would refer to as, uh, direct operating expenses. Okay. is primarily your feed. If you're in the feedlot industry and you're buying your lambs in and finishing and then selling them, that those lambs being purchased would be considered in there. Your vet uh, flock health expenses, your breeding expenses, seed and fertilizer, okay? Um, that that area um, is is uh, termed cost of goods sold. And, and all of these numbers from OMAFRA show, come up in this formula now. Um, direct operating expenses, then add fuel, equipment repairs, any custom work, so our shearing, you know, if you have someone coming in tr foot trimming for you, um, I'm getting an echo. Um, marketing, our marketing fees, hired labor. Um, overhead expenses then would add utilities, insurance, our office expenses, any professional fees, our accountant fees, it's that sort of thing, and our manage management labor. Um, and then we really should be looking at um, our annual cost of capital. So this is your depreciation on equipment, buildings, your leasing, if any, of, if you're doing that, rent and property taxes. And then finally, our interest expenses. Okay. And again, I'm not diving into any of them. I'm just going reviewing them so that when we look at these numbers, um, you know where those numbers are coming from and what they mean. And again, I've linked two there's two links on this page in your proceedings. The top one will take you directly to that five years of data that I talked about on the OMAFRA. And they're no longer on the OMAFRA site. Everything's migrating to a Ontario government site. Okay. So that will take you directly to that, to that page. Um, and the bottom one is a link to the most recent uh, PDF of John's uh, guide to cost production budgeting. So it goes into much deeper detail of some of these and what they mean than, than what I'm doing. Um, so looking at 2021, this is our latest year of data available through that database. Um, we have um, two columns there. 
we have, oops, wrong button again. <clears throat> we have the entire group. Again, this is 200 U's plus and 80% um, of their income or more coming from, from sheep and lambs. And then the second data set is taking out of that 17, the top 10 flocks uh, and their numbers presented. And what we do is we look at revenue at 100%, okay? So think of this as percentages or dollars. For every dollar of revenue, these other numbers fall underneath that. So on average in 2021, cost of goods sold for those 17 farms was 54 cents. So cost them in feed, what was in that? What was all in that one? Feed, seed and fertilizer. Anyone else remember? Hmm? No, that was in the next one down. Um, 54 cents, so we have 40, 46 cents left, right? That's a typo. No, it's not, I've taken the, I've taken the one lie down. So for 54 cents compared to our top 10 at 39 cents. So um, 15 cents difference in that. Um, the, our next category of direct operating expenses of 40 cents versus 27 cents. So already we've almost spent our dollar. We have six cents left as a cost, a contribution margin, right? <clears throat> so then once we cover overhead, uh, annual cost of capital, we're into the into the red. I should have put red in there, I didn't think of it. And then we add the interest on and we're in almost, well, 22 cents in the red by the time. And these aren't small flocks, right? 776 use is the average of that group, okay? Top 10, a little bit nicer. We are at 34% contribution margin, which would be on par with other livestock uh, commodities. And maybe I haven't looked at the swine ones, I should have, but uh, probably even better than the swine right now because of poor prices in the industry. Um, but, you know, at the operating profit, we're at 14%. And once our interests are paid, we're sitting at around 12%. So two, almost three times difference. Um, and yeah, 200 more, not quite 200 more use, right? So why is that? It's a small sample, 17 farms. How many production systems are included in that? I can't tell you from looking at the numbers, but I can guarantee you it's across the board. Um, and because it's only one year's data, how many here are on an accelerated lambing system? I see a few hands, right? You know if you look at one year next to the, to the next year on your financials, right? Which year have you lambed most of the flock in? Because they've, you know, if we're looking at three three lambings in two years, uh, in one of the years, you're going to have considerably more lambings out of the same production unit than you are in that second year. So when we look at single year's data, it can be very misleading as to what the actual health of the industry or an individual flock is. <clears throat> so to try and cover some of that off, I took a three-year average out of those numbers um, and, and showed them here. Um, and keeping in mind that when, when we do that, it may not be the same 17 farms, so a good majority of them will be the same, but there may be some that are in 2019 that are not there in 21 and vice versa. Um, but it looks, it looks a little better than what we've seen in the last slide. Um, so a contribution, uh, margin of 14 instead of six and a contribution margin of 37% uh, instead of, uh, um, I think it was 34. So pretty close to the same, but, but a little bit better. Okay. So what, what's, my, what's my message here? It's not like, don't, I mean, yes, we, we will always hear, you need, to, you need to increase your flock size so you're an economic unit, but it's more important to look at, okay, if I'm if I'm in an accelerated lambing system, I shouldn't be looking at one year and comparing it against the next. I should be looking at windows of financial data 
and comparing it against the next uh, window of that. Uh, or, you know, do a three-year average, 20, uh, 19, 20, 21, next one would be 20, 21, 22, and see where the changes are there um, as to what your financial health is going to be. Um, this is shifting gears a little bit. So it's taking that information um, and saying, okay, um, what, what does it tell us? Like we had... 17 or 18 farms in that in that uh, 21 uh, uh, group. Uh, what does those numbers tell us? Well, when we look at the top half, okay, so the top 10 flocks, our numbers are down the side there, their percentages, what they represented. And in this example, and this is an example, invented example, um, we have... Um, what those represent, what their uh, numbers would be. So farm A, 24, sorry, 34%, farm B, 47. Um, but the profit margins are about the same, right? 8%. The two points highlighted as to show that if I stood up here and said, well, you all should do this, it may not be the right answer for you because if you're in this category, uh, that this is your hot spot or your highest uh, uh, cost, you want to focus on that, whereas I might be wanting to focus on my overall cost of goods sold. Maybe I need to do a better job of managing feed costs or or what have you, right? Um, so again, recognizing that there's no blanket answer uh, on um, uh, uh, how we all can how we all can reduce our costs of production. I can't give you one answer. Um, I took this from a presentation um, uh, that was looking at, I, actually I found it because of the presentation I'm giving later this afternoon, but on scale, economies of scale, finding economies of scale. And I thought, oh, that would work just grand in this talk, talk as well. So if we look at this line and say that that's our industry, Okay, that's the cost of production curve for our industry. And dependent where we are as an individual, um, this, this farmer, producer here, their cost of production is here. Um, here's another one, another one, another one. And this one's highlighted because that would be our most efficient um, point of, in terms of cost of production, our size of our scale versus our output. Um, and then our cost of production start climbing. And what I want you guys to think about is this here, okay? So each one of us on here has our own little mini curve uh, as to what we're doing individually, but as an industry, <clears throat> this, is, this is what we would, would be looking at. But as an individual, what, what might cause your cost of production to go up after you'd been... Uh, I'm going to say you had everything working really, really well. Okay. Other outside of things like, you know, the feed cost has gone up X percent since 2021. Right. Labor. Right. Yeah. Um, do we have someone that can run mics around? Thanks. Uh, they're right here. So let let's say that let's say that we're going through an expansion, we're increasing our flock size, and we've we've uh, had to put up more infrastructure, more buildings. Uh, Matt, I think you have a comment. Check. I was just going to comment uh, higher mortality rates. Yep. So on a per unit basis, uh, you're spending more money. Yep. Yeah, it could be a disease outbreak or something of that nature. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. But the biggie on this one is, <clears throat> as an industry, it may be um, it may be an external force, right? Our our market prices dropped at the same time as our as our uh, uh, input costs uh, went up, 
and we as producers really have no control over what we get for our lambs to a point, right? I mean, we can decide what week we gamble on the market, but um, we really we really don't have an impact on on what that overall scale is. So, um, um, yeah, the cost of production because this is based on revenue as one, and then our our cost of goods sold um, uh, down below that. Um, but what I wanted is for you to take home from this is that we're all on our own little curve, even though as an industry, we were, we're creating this, this bigger curve. Um, and on, where we all want to be is at the bottom uh, of that little basin, regardless of where we are on that scale. Um, so with this one, I thought I'd throw this in again, more for reference. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but looking at the three year versus the single year. And, and we already touched on this a little bit, right? And there's really not that many uh, differences, except when we get down to the bottom on that three year one for long-term planning, uh, this three year one uh, would be a better use uh, than, than the 2021 or a single year. I'm picking on 2021 because it's the, pardon me, the most recent numbers we have. Um, in terms of resources, again, I'm going to refer you. I'm not spending time on this slide. It's there. It's in the handout uh, in your proceedings. Um, but that, that's basically highlighting some of the things that you would look to uh, in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, looking for resources that could help you uh, uh, walk through some of this if you're not already doing it. Uh, just for curiosity, how many uh, how many are participating in agri stability and get a tip report? One, two. Okay, um, that one. I mean, you basically as a as a participant, you're getting a, a report yearly, and so um, uh, you're and and within that report, you have your own numbers plus the average of the group. And because I haven't seen one in a while, I'm not even sure if they have a, a top 10 or top 50% like they do, like I've showed you in the other ones. Um, so shifting gears, this is looking at cost control. Um, <clears throat> and this is from that 2009, 2011 present uh, benchmark study. Uh, the cost of homegrown forages. So this is our uh, not just pasture, but um, but but our corn silage, our hay, our haylage, um, and uh, there's two graphs, two sorry, two slides of John's from there. The one looking at uh, from the high profit group, what percent of each one of these factored is uh, represented, and in the low profit group, the bottom of the group, um, how that pie pie chart uh, differed, and. Honestly, the biggest difference at that time, again, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, was was the use of pasture um, uh, between the two. Uh, you know, corn silage and haylage. Yes, there's a bit of a difference there, uh, but the but the biggie was that that difference in pasture. And I guess for those that maybe are newer in the industry, um, our larger pasture-based flocks tend to be. I have to use the word ten to be in Eastern Ontario, Northeastern Ontario, and there's a few around uh, what I call the, the center of Central Ontario. Uh, but generally down in this area, I mean, it's you guys are primarily an accelerated system, not to say accelerated systems aren't you using pasture um, because this group was a combination of both accelerated and, and uh, annual, annual flocks. Um, in the bottom slide of John's, uh, the numbers, 208 days, the high profit uh, group, their use were on pasture, an average of 208 days versus 150 um, in, uh, in the low profit group. And honestly, it'd be great to be able to do these numbers again now and see if that makes, if the numbers still make sense or not, right? Um, but, why I put this one up here is, you know, I could stand up here and say, this says we should all be pasturing. So go on out there and start pasturing your flock. You're going to lower your cost of production. But the reality is, is should you really do that as an individual, right? If you have the skill set, I'm going to say yes, 
But if it's going to be a new learning curve for you and learning how to manage coyote predation and parasites and all the rest of that that you're maybe not having to deal with uh, in a totally confined system uh, and you're fairly new in the industry, maybe it's not the right thing to do. And it's certainly not going to be the right thing to do to fix a short term cost of production situation. Um, and, you know, looking longer term is, you know, if like, should we be as an industry, should we be promoting producers to seriously look at where they're farming sheep? Right. There's lots of areas of the province that if you were young and ambitious and had a mentor that could, you know, teach you how to put up permanent fence and, and fence law or mobile fence, there's tons of land that is not being utilized by grain cropping. Um, and uh, there's certainly opportunities there for, uh, for grazing. Does it make the best market lamb? Maybe not. Does it make economic sense? Lots of times it does. Right. Um, and uh, so as I say, it's to me, this is more posing questions or provoking uh, a thought process that you're going to go back and, and look at uh, and, and question uh, maybe some of the decisions that are being uh, or suggestions or recommendations that are being being put to you as to what's your best choices of moving forward. Um, so. Looking at other cost control areas, of course, I like harping on equipment purchases um, because to me, uh, we, I mean, we all love to buy brand new stuff, right? Um, but I'm going to tell you that you're going to get more bang for your buck by putting your, your equipment finance investment into something like a handling system if you don't have it versus buying a, uh, I was going to say, hey, buying, I'm thinking, well, you probably, there's not probably not many of them left in in the country anymore, um, but buying paying equipment, right? How many days a year do we use haying equipment versus how many days a year do we use our handling equipment? Um, and again, that's going to be everyone's individual individual situation. Uh, flock management, uh, things like breeding management costs, um, annual lambing, other than keeping rams in good condition and you know making sure we have enough rams. There are, and, and I'm, my vet, if he's still sitting in here, he's going to say he is. He's going to say, you know, your mineral costs better be in there too, right? Um, but is the cost is different than someone who's using uh, out-of-season breeding techniques uh, to uh, get those use breeding at the time of year when they don't naturally want to breed. So you automatically have a higher breeding management costs than, than someone who's only lambing annually um, that you have to make up for in, in extra lambs. What about on-farm feed wastage? Now I'm getting into some of the things that I think are more, could be more immediate. Um, we tend to, I'm going to say, ignore how much feed gets wasted or lost in harvest. I mean, it's not wasted because if it's on the field, it goes back in the ground as fertilizer. Uh, but we do, there is wastage and loss in harvest. There's wastage and loss in storage systems. Um, and there's wastage and loss in our feed out delivery system as well. And I guess to me, the one that always comes to mind in the feed out is when we have animals on self feed, and I'm going to say our market lambs, our finishing lambs, paying attention to the height of the feeder, if it's a self feeder, that the height of the feeder bunk uh, needs to be adjusted with the height of the lambs. If a lamb can get its feet in the feeder, you have feed waste. And if you see corn on the floor or pellets on the floor, you have significant feed waste. If you can actually see it in the bedding, you have significant feed waste in your operation. Okay. I'm not going to give a percentage, but it's, if you can physically see it, you have, a big opportunity to do uh, cost savings there. Um, use, to cost, use of cost share programs. We're into a new five-year program uh, with the provincial and federal governments. Um, there are going to be areas, uh, I'm, uh, I think uh, soil and crop, uh, Barb is here, um, so could certainly uh, pick her brain on, on what some of those are. Um, but I'm always going to come back to you and say, are you buying that because you need it? Or are you buying it because you're getting a 50%? It's not 50. 
I'm going to say a 30% knock in price because of the cost share program. And if it's the answer number two, maybe you need to reevaluate why you're buying it, right? Um, at that, at the, at this particular time, maybe you need it five down, years down the road. Um, and um, now's the time to not buy it, but maybe in two years you buy it, right? Uh, so use the cost share programs, but but don't use them as a means of buying something that you really don't need. Um, I put this slide up because, um, um, you know, you want, we, we, we like making lists, five, seven, 10 ways to reduce. And I really thought when I seen this one for manufacturing and the website that I took those five from is, is there for you to go back and look at. Um, uh, but this was a, a, a manufacturing uh, presentation and basically said, know your business inside out. That's their top way of reducing production costs. Optimize your production line. Improve and optimize facilities. Limit your inventory and reduce external costs. So if you look at those and say, well, what do those mean for me as a sheep producer? Um, I'm still going to say that answer number one is the same, right? Know your business inside out. Um, and well, what's optimizing a production line? Really, right? It's those lambs, or if we're selling breeding stock, those animals that are going to someone else's farm is our production line. Um, and um, uh, we need to be as as lean in our production line as we possibly can. Uh, so my question on number two is, do we have the records that would enable us uh, to identify our strong and weak areas, like I showed in that previous slide with the yellow little boxes, right? Um, if we can identify our strong areas and our weak areas, we at least can start making changes. Um, if I'm doing my financials once a year because the tax man requires me to, you can't use those numbers to make any business decisions, right? I'm just thinking about what Bill said earlier around, right? The center of group in production, we looked at the carcass thing this morning yeah. and dropping the high and the low, optimizing the production line. You wanna have everything in that center to maximize your throughput. You bet. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so number three, trying to match that number three, improve and optimize facilities. You heard me harp about the handling equipment. But it's, you know, you decide what equipment you prior you prioritize what equipment you need to spend on first to make you the most money uh, short term and then, you know, invest in the other equipment at a later date as needed. Um, from a production perspective, and this is, you know, trying to equate back to limiting our inventory. To me, it's looking at things like calling the non-productive animals in our flock. And I focused on on the use there. Um, and put a sub point that, um, and I think one of you alluded to it when you guys were chatting with, with Bill and, and Wahab is on our market lambs, we all have, you know, what do we call them? The tail end lambs on our place. They're called the dogs, right? Those ones that just never do well. And at some point, and it's not at market day that you identify them as the poor doers. Um, maybe we should be looking at them much sooner uh, than we do. And maybe we sh there are certain animals that we should be trying to get to market weight. We should dispose of them somehow. And whether that's through a private market or I'm going to say it on farm euthanasia, um, uh, I think we, we should be looking at that and saying, well, you know, I hope he's going to get better. I hope I can make a, you know, an actual useful market lamb out of him or her. Um, and I don't think we're good at this uh, in in Ontario in, and as Canadians, uh, as as some other uh, cultures maybe. Um, but what's wrong with you know doing a bit of negotiation on purchase prices from your suppliers, right? You phone them up and you say, "What do you, what what do I have to pay for this?" And they say, oh, "Well, X." And you say, "Oh, okay." Um, how many of us sh maybe should be saying, "Well, you know." Is there any way you could knock 2%, 3%? I mean, depends on your volumes uh, as to what is they're going to be able to do on that. So um, those are my top five.
on reducing production costs. Um, so in summary, you know, you get tired of hearing this and people get tired of seeing it, but we need to start keeping, not just keeping records, because I think we all keep records, but do you ever take those records and actually analyze them and say, what did that decision that I made, what impact did that have on, am I, am I any better off by making that decision and following through on it or not? Um, and I already meant, made the comment about annually is not good enough in terms of in terms of uh, uh, looking at our financials and seeing where we sit relative to uh, uh, where we want to be sitting. Um, I'll and a review on the, that three or five year average uh, can often be uh, much more useful than looking at a single year's data, um, and especially in those accelerated blocks, especially when we're looking at our medium and long term planning. Um, <clears throat> I would say one caution with that is where we're sitting right now, maybe not so much now, but last year in 2022, when land prices dropped suddenly, feed input prices were still going up. Um, I don't think you'd want to be making decisions based on a three-year average at that time, right? It's, you're going to be making decisions on what's happening immediately and what you think might be happening in the next uh, next short window of time. Um, and know that a weakness in one area, like when we're looking at our financials, I may not be great at, I don't know. Well, I know I'm not great at doing my financials, right? None of us are, but few of us are. Um, I know there's some in the room that are awesome at it. Uh, uh, and I envy, uh, always, always envy that they, they get excited about doing those, but, but, you know, can that be offset? And maybe the financial one isn't a good example. Maybe I'm not great at um, at, at uh, uh, keeping my feed costs under control, but I'm great at you know keeping one of my other expenses under control that that sort of balances out at the end of of the day. So knowing that it weakness, obviously trying to do something about it, but don't you know put your head in the sand and say, oh my God, I can't do that very well, so I'm just going to give up and carry on right change change production systems or change out of sheep into something else it's not going to fix that um and this last one i have to uh give credit where credit that is due and that's again john uh, molan house from omafra um benchmarking ourselves against ourselves is as important if not more important than trying to benchmark ourselves against somebody else or a group average right what's an average I hate the word. What's an average? I'm going to go back to the curve, right? <clears throat> There's our average. But we have uh, we have producers up here. We have producers here. We have producers here, right? This is our best. This is our best producer. But if we average that line to flatten it out, the average really is meaningless to compare ourselves against. We want to be comparing, if we're going to benchmark ourselves against, we we want that, you know, with Omafra numbers, it's the top 50% because our sample size is so small. But if we had 300 farms in that, we, we would actually be able to generate the top 10% data to say, there's where your best ones are. Here's where your, you know, your next percentile, maybe down to 75% are, and here's your bottom 25% that you can say, well, at least I'm not in the bottom 25. So um, yeah, a lot of times remember that we we should be uh, benchmarking ourselves against where, where we were last year and where we wanna be uh, next year. So questions, anyone? <clears throat> 